as most of you know, the axial skeleton, the big part of the axial skeleton and the most complicated thing is the skull. Okay. And the skull actually has these structures called fontanelles and they're fibrous membranes that connect the cranial bones. The cranial bones are not completely fused in the fetus and in the infant. And there's a number of reasons for it. The big reason is to allow compression of the head and brain growth, allow for compression of the head and brain growth at the birth and uh, to allow some sliding of the bone plates over the top of one another as the head goes through the birth, birth canal. Most are replaced by bone in the first or second years. The anterior fontanelle takes one to two years. This is the anterior fontanelle. And if you've had a child, you know about this, or if you've worked in the healthcare or you uh, 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 got to palpate some other, some other person's uh, child, uh, this, this is one of the last places to fuse as a pediatrician or as uh, somebody who uh, does well child visits. That's one of the things you will do is palpate the fontanelle to see if it's closed. You don't want it to close too early and you don't want to close it to close too late. Uh, but it's one of the, this is a, obviously an early skull before it is fused, okay? Notice that we still have the sutures in progress. We still have the sutures in progress, but the fontanelle, the frontal suture is, is actually going to fuse. But this is this is what the uh, uh, fetal skull looks like. And if we were in the laboratory, we have we actually have some models of fetal skulls. When we look at it. this, is the anterior fontanelle, and like the last slide says, it stays open about one to two years. And if you're if you're going to the healthcare industry and you're uh, job is to do well baby checks and that's one of the things you're going to be checking. It's also made bulge if there's additional, if there's uh, a, a cause for increased pressure inside the cranium, okay? The adult skull has four prominent sutures. If you have watched the videos, okay, and it's my suggestion to you, I watched both of the videos again yesterday before I started putting the tests together to make sure the questions I asked came right directly from the video. So if you watch the videos and made your word list, you're going to be fine because you'll just zip through the test. You'll get it done in 30 minutes and be done with it. If you didn't do it, then you're going to have to flip through the book. But he explains those things fairly well. Uh, and with a little bit of uh, watching the videos, a little bit of additional supplementation from the textbook or from Google, wherever, you should really do really well. Everybody should make 50 points on this. But there's four prominent sutures. There's the coronal suture between the frontal bones and the two parietal bones. This is the frontal bone and this is the parietal bone. And so the coronal suture goes between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. If you were doing a forehead lift, if you're doing a forehead lift uh, in plastic surgery, you'd make a coronal suture uh, before you started doing the uh, portion of the forehead lift. Uh, if you're doing intracranial surgery, a coronal suture may be uh, the uh, uh, incision you're going to, uh, uh, a coronal incision, I said a coronal suture, a coronal incision may be what you were going to use before you did a forehead lift. Also, maybe the incision of choice, depending on what part of the brain you were going to be operating on. But you do need to know the names of the bones name the the names of the bones of the skull okay whatever he went over in the video and you hope you made your word list from that uh those are the things that are amend that are possibility on the test but this is the frontal bone this is the parietal bones this is the temporal bones this is acceptable it, they're not very hard we actually had a similar picture to this a similar picture to this on my practical and medical school and i got the frontal and parietal bones confused for whatever reason but there is a coronal suture. It did divides the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. There's only one frontal bone because it, it fused, okay? There is a sagittal suture. Remember, there's a sagittal plane. There's a sagittal suture between the two parietal bones. Here's a parietal bone and here's a parietal bone. This is an acceptable bone here, okay? There's a lambdoidal suture. This is the lambdoidal suture between the parietal bones and the occipital bone. And this is the Squamous suture or squamosal suture, you can see it called both names, and it is between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. Here, this is this orange is the temporal bone, and here is the parietal bone. So this is the squamosal or squamous suture between those, okay? 
in our vertebral column. Our vertebral column is not straight. We have a cervical curve, okay? This is anterior, this is posterior. This is anterior to the right, this is posterior to the left. We have a cervical curve, a thoracic curve, and a lumbar curve, okay? We have a cervical curve in the neck, a thoracic cor uh, curve in the uh, back and abdominal area and lordotic curve in the lower abdominal area. And then the sacrum is fused, okay? We have actually a little bit of a sacral curve there. This, these curves increase the functionality and resilience and make it less rigid and less susceptible to damage, providing some give. If the spinal cord was just like this, excuse me, if the spinal column was just straight like this, and we had any kind, if we needed required to make any kind of torquing motion, okay, any kind of torquing motion, it would be, it would cre uh, create significant stress onto the spinal, onto the spinal column if it was straight and fused in this direction. However, because of this, there's, we have all kinds of flexibility evolved in the spinal column itself. I golf and obviously, if a picture was being or a x-ray is being made uh, uh, while I was golf or not while I was golfing, but while a real golfer was golfing, the you would see a lot of bend in the spinal cord. They are abnormalities. And these are some abnormalities that you need to know. Scoliosis is a lateral curvature to the spine. Scur scoliosis is a lateral curvature to the spine. They actually at Nemours Children's Hospital have a scoliosis clinic. And so uh, 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 patients come certainly from North Florida, okay, uh, and what they have pediatric orthopedic surgeons that are specialists in scoliosis. This is something that is usually corrected early on, okay, uh, and if you can get in there and correct early on, and what they usually do is put some kind of rod, they straighten this, the column out and put some kind of rod in here. You lose some flexibility, but you no longer have this abnormal curve. And there's one of the golfers on the LPGA Tour, Christy Kerr, and she had scoliosis surgery. She had scoliosis when she was young. And so she's got a rod in her back here to keep her spine, to keep her spine in straight fashion. So this is scoliosis. It's an abnormal lateral curvature, abnormal lateral curvature. Okay. This is kyphosis. Okay. We normally see kyphosis in either older people who are I call it hunched over. So this is this is kyphosis, a kyphotic, kyphotic spine. Or you can see it in this this abnormalities, or you can see it sometimes in people with significant respiratory problems. But this is this is kyphosis. Okay, this is a and a dorsally exaggerated. You know, we do, you know, we have a we have a curve in our cervical spine and some curve in our thoracic spine, but it, this is exaggerated. This is exaggerated. Okay. This is a kyphotic spine. Okay. And then finally we have lordosis, which is exaggerated lumbar curvature. The pelvis tilts back, uh, usually outgrown when abdominal muscle strength increases. Uh, you see uh the gymnast, you know, when they, after they finish their routine, they accentuate this lordotic curve. They accentuate the lordotic curve. Also, pregnant women have a lordotic curve, and the reason they're doing that lordotic curve is they're trying to counterbalance the weight of the abdomen. So this is a, a lordotic curve, okay? We do have a curve in our lumbar spine, but this is an exaggerated lordotic curve. Some people have a pronounced lordotic curve, but it, they're not symptomatic with it. So those are the three types of abnormalities, uh, lord uh, scoliosis, kyphosis, and lordosis. That used to be a big problem for whatever reason when I asked questions on, uh, on the exam, face-to-face -face exam. We have a, our intervertebral disc, okay? Our intervertebral disc is composed of two things. It's composed of a nucleus propulsive. That is this gel-like material here, okay? That's, it's a gel-like material. It's a cushioning material. And then we have annulus fibrosis, which is this portion of the uh, uh, connective tissue that surrounds the nucleus propulsus. Its job is to maintain the integrity of this gel-like substance. And as you can imagine, constantly all day long, this is being squeezed as we 
get up as we sit down, as we move around, we are putting pressure on this nucleus propulsus. But as long as the annulus fibrosus, which is this outermost connected tissue ring, maintains its integrity, we don't have a problem. However, if it becomes weakened, okay, or ruptures, then this particular this particular gel-like material can herniate, herniate backwards into, into this space here. And if you will see, this is the spinal column here. These are spinal nerves right here. These are spinal nerves right here, fix it, fixing to exit the foramen, okay? And now you have impingement on the spinal nerve at this level, impingement on the spinal nerve at this level because of the weakness of this annulus fibrosis. And the treatment in the old days, treatment of choice was to go in and decompress this, decompress this area right here. And you would go in from the back, go in from the back, make an incision, take out a small portion of bone, uh, go in here and decompress the annulus fibrosis, excuse me, decompress the nucleus propulsus to decrease the mass, and that would relieve the, uh, the pressure on the spinal nerve right in you have to be very careful doing that you can't be aggressive doing that because right outside here right outside here is the aorta so if you get very aggressive and you say i'm going to get this completely out i'm going to get this completely out and you go in there with your little shear shears these uh, little pincher things that you're taking this out and you happen to go through here and take a bite out of here then all of a sudden you've taken a bite out of the aorta and now you have a hole in the aorta. You have somebody on the operating room, operating room table is face down, and you truly now have a surgical emergency. And uh, now you have now you have to take the drapes off, flip them over, uh, get them prepped and draped, and usually call a general surgeon in or a vascular surgeon in, in on an emergency basis. One of uh, Jeff Chandler, uh, who's an actor of all, I never, I don't, I, I, he wasn't in my time. He was before my time. But this happened to him when they were they were uh, moving uh, his disc. They took a bite of his aorta, and this is a uh, example. This is a normal disc. Okay, this is the normal disc. This is an MRI. Okay, this is an MRI. This is a normal disc here. This is a herniated herniated disc. The annulus the annulus has lost its integrity, allowing the nucleus propulsus, which is just a gelatinous mass that's between the two vertebra, the two vertebra, and it's held into, it's confined into its compartment by the vertebra above, the vertebra below, and it, and the annulus, well, once that annulus, like I say, the integrity of the annulus breaks down, then we have herniation of the nucleus propulsus, okay? Have herniation of the nucleus propulsus, and then we have impingement on the spinal nerves, and so this is an MRI. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the appendicular skeleton, not very much. These are the these are the arches of the foot. I have never asked a question about the arches of the foot, but the, as you're well aware, there are a number of arches of the foot. Okay, they're medial, lateral, and transverse arches, and they give a unique spring to the foot. Okay, allows us to do a number of movements uh, on the foot with the feet that we that people that uh, animals who walk on four legs are not able to do. They can do some of those things, but they're not able to do all the things that we have. And these are the arches here. Like I say, I'm going through the slides, but I've never asked a question on it. The materials here, if you ever need it, obviously, if you go into uh, a, a, a type of field that you specialize in the feet, you'll learn a whole lot more in, uh, in depth and detail, okay? Male versus female skeleton, males have longer, heavier bones. Well, they're going to have heavier bones when we talk about bone being laid down. We said that if the, as a general people that were heavier in mass, heavier in weight, had thicker bones, okay? Males, as a general, are taller than females, not always, but are taller than females, and that's probably related to testosterone stimulation. Males have more prominent bone marking. But the pelvic, there's significant pelvic differences, significant pelvic differences in male versus female, and it's related to the widening of the, to the capability of uh, 
the birth canal, why the birth canal being at maximum width during birth. Okay. These are the three things that are differences related to childbearing. Iliac fossa is shallower in the shallower in the female than and wider. We'll look at a picture in just a minute. The acetabulum, the acetabulum is the depression in the ilia where the head of the female hits uh fits into it is the acetabulum that's going to be on the test guaranteed 100 percent okay and the pelvic angle in females are 80 to 90 degrees we have a male versus a female male versus a female pelvis here male versus here is the pelvic angle you can see that the pelvic angle is wider you can see that this particular area is wider okay the pelvic basin is wider and the acetabulum, which you can't really see very good, but this is where they are right here and right here. This is where the head of the femur fit in and the female, they're right here and here. Okay. They're right here and here. So they're wider apart. And this is to, uh, this is to, uh, a, an adaption of the skeleton to make the birth canal wider for uh, birth. Articulations, where two are bone, where, where two bones meet. Okay, the bones are gonna meet. We already looked at the fontanelles. The fontanelles, we have bones sitting there, okay? They're next to each other that haven't fused, okay? But there are a number of places in the body where the bones meet, okay? Number of places in the body where the bones meet. We can classify them. There's a number of ways of classification. These classifications are uh, obviously artificial classifications. Somebody thought them up, okay? The first is an immovable joint, okay? An immovable joint. And the best ones we have now is once fusion occurs in the bones of the skull, that is really not, they really don't move, okay? So that is a synarthrotic, or synarthrotic, Synarthroscopic joint, okay, synarthroscopic articulation that is immovable, okay. The next one is amphiarthroscopic, slightly movable. That is the vertebra, the interactions of the vertebra, the facets, the superior and inferior facets, are in articulations of the vertebra, okay. They have sub movement. There's not a whole lot of movement there, okay. You can't, you can't. You, you don't have unlimited movement in your vertebra, but you have some movement, okay? As opposed to the skull where you have no movement. And then you have dysarthroscopic, which are freely movable. And these are the articulations. These are bone to bone articulations. So we're talking about articulation, bone to bone articulations that are freely movable in the arms and the legs. Then that, that was classification uh, by degree of movement. Now we're gonna have classification on a structural basis, okay? Fibrous joints, bones uh, joined by fibrous tissue. There's no cavity, okay? They're either immovable or slightly movable. So these are fibrous articulations. So these are these bones are joined by fibrous tissue. Bones are joined by fibrous tissue. There's no cavity as opposed to a, and we'll get to the last joint we talked to is a synovial joint, okay? Synovial joint is your knee joint where it has a cavity, okay? So when they talk about no cavity, just, and you, you want to try to uh, picture that in your, in your head, then what, then what you're looking at is the knee joint that has a cavity in it that has the fluid and everything like that. Immovable or only slightly movable. Sutures are an example of that. Sutures are an example because we have a suture line with dense fibrous connective tissue in the in between these sutures, but there is no movement in those sutures. Okay, so this is a fibrous connection. These are sutures. And remember, we have a number of sutures. You'll need to know those for your lab practical. So if you have your bone list, you can fly through it. If you don't have your bone list, then you're going to get your atlas out or something else, and it's going to take you a whole lot more time. Uh, syndesmosis has larger connecting fibers and sutures, and this is an example here. This is syndosmosis. We've got these particular fibers connecting, connecting. This is the tibia and this is the fibula. This is the tibia and this is the fibula, okay? 
and we have these connecting fibers to allow some movement, okay, to allow some movement, but not very much, okay, not very much, okay. We have this gomphiosis, which is a peg in the socket. You know, there's fibrous tissue here, and the tooth is down in this socket. That was the fibrous connections, okay. Uh, no cavity, and those were the examples. Very little movement uh, uh, in the in that particular thing. Bone, so as bones joined by fibrous tissue, this is bones joined by cartilage, no cavity, mostly immovable, okay? And these are some examples, the epithelial plate, which was temporarily hyaline cartilage, which was a, uh, the, which joined the diaphysis to the epithesis. And then this type of joint, this type of joint between the first rib and the sternum, between the first rib and the sternum, uh, is made up of hyaline cartilage, okay? We have this pubic synthesis. We have pubic synthesis here. I would know that. You're going to see that on your exam. Hyaline cartilage, fibro cartilage in the center between the vertebra, okay? And vertebra is an example, okay? And the pubic synthesis. So these are symphysis joints, symphysis, excuse me, symphysis articulations, symphysis articulations. And these are some of the examples, our vertebra, okay, and our uh, pubic synthesis. Then we go to our synovial joint. We get to our synovial joint, which, I, which uh, was always a favorite extra credit question if we would uh, uh, if we'd had a face-to-face -face, uh, lab practical or we'd have done bones, that's always one of the extra credit questions was the synovial joint. And Sometimes it is a uh, matching question on uh, the exam. It's a joint cavity separated by fluid, freely movable, knees or shoulders, okay? Structure of a synovial joint. There is articular cartilage that covers the epithesis of the two bones being connected. So we have articular cartilage. We have articular cartilage. These are, these are the structures of a synovial joint. We have articular cartilage. We learned about that. We know that in each one of the epithesis, okay, the, the shaft is the diaphysis. This is the epithesis, okay? This is the epithesis, okay? The shaft is diaphysis. We can see the epithesial line. And remember the epithesial line. In the process before the growth spurt, this is where uh, bone formation is going to occur. Synovial are joint cavity, a space filled with synovial fluid, okay? This is the cavity here with synovial fluid. Normally, you can palpate a little bit of fluid in your joint if you bang your joint up pretty good and you don't get a hematoma. I'm just talking about you. You get an excess of synovial fluid or you get some edema in there. You can actually, you know, you can uh, push down on one side and fill it balls on the other side. If you get too much joint fluid in there, uh, your, uh, whoever you're going to see as far as your uh, medical practitioner may have to stick a big needle in there and draw some of the joint fluid out because you get too much of the fluid in there. It is painful, okay? Some also have meniscus cartilage, works like a sponge, pressure and joint releases fluid, also carries nutrient to cartilage, okay? So we have... We have our synovial membrane. This is our synovial membrane, which is going to release the fluid, okay? We have our joint, okay, which has synovial fluid in it. This is our synovial membrane. It's going to release the fluid, okay? We have articular cartilage. We have an outer fibrous cartilage, okay, that is continuous to the periosteum. So we, here's the periosteum coming up. Here's the periosteum coming up. And we have an outer fibrous layer. Here's the outer fibrous layer, okay? continue with the capsule, and inner layer is the synovial membrane that we just talked about. Here's the synovial membrane. So these are the parts of a synovial joint. And so I would be conversant with these parts because you, there's the possibility exists that you could get this as a, massing, as a matching question. It's not hard. You should be able to get, you know, match all these things because as you saw in the matching questions, they were all one for one. There was no extra questions are no questions where uh, one answer we use, use two or three times. And then you have out, obviously outside reinforcement ligaments, which are these, these big ligaments outside, they're outside reinforcement ligaments. 
uh, that are outside the knee capsule. Those are the ones that usually get damaged. Uh, you know, if you're a sports person or jogging or something like that. Remember, tendons attach muscles to bone and ligaments attach bone to bone. We've talked about ligaments and we've talked about tendons, uh, but we will go over, so we will look at tendons a little bit more in depth when we look at chapters nine and 10. Nine will have a, that will be the first time we'll really hit on some physiology because we will talk about the well, anatomy and physiology. We'll talk, about the, we'll talk about skeletal muscle primarily and we'll talk about the striations from skeletal muscle and we'll talk about how actin and myosin slide on top of each other. So we'll, when we get into chapters nine and 10, chapter 10 is just about the muscles, chapter nine is the muscle physiology and we'll do a lot of talking about some physiology. And that'll be first big time we'll have talked about physiology and we'll do the same thing when we get to the nervous system. And then finally, there's nerves and blood vessels in the joint. We also have bursa, okay? Bursa are just sacs around particular bony structures, primary, you know, there are a lot of them are in the shoulder, okay? That reduce friction between adjacent structures and you can get inflammation of these, which is called bursitis, okay? They're just fibrous sacs, which is no real fluid. It's not like the knee joint, okay? It's not like the knee joint. These are just separate, completely separate sacs that are just there for cushioning, okay? And then because I did a lot of hand surgery, there is a tendon sheath around the tendon, okay? Around the tendon, if we were looking at the hand, and there is fluid uh, uh, supplied in here, okay? We have synovial membranes gonna supply fluid in here to lubricate the movement of the tendon as it glides back and forth, as it glides back and forth. So there's tendon sheets, okay? This wraps completely around the tendon to protect, number one, to protect the tendon, but to provide a, a lubricant so, so allow easy sliding of the tendon. Can, do, can we reach imbalance in there? Uh, number one imbalance in the bony skeleton is arthritis, okay? Arthritis is not one disease, it's, mold, it's like cancer. There is not one cancer, okay? You know, there's esophageal cancer, there's stomach cancer, there's kidney cancer, there's uterine cancer, there's ovary cancer, there's bladder cancer, there's skin cancer. It's the same way with arthritis. There's a hundred, at least a hundred different types of arthritis. It is a very difficult disease to treat, okay? Patients, uh, start developing significant pain and significant abnormalities and surgery doesn't always help them okay you can see patient uh, if you've ever seen uh, individuals with their hands that are very contracted up because of arthritis and you can do surgery on those on those patients but surgery does in fact sometimes surgery actually makes the condition worse they have pain swelling stiffness in the joints you can have rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, okay? Starts between ages 30 and 50. Women are three times more often affected. I had a first cousin who had severe arthritis. Her, both her hands literally looked crippled, okay? Look crippled, and they, they look like this. And you would think, okay, I'm gonna straighten this out and put a uh, silicone joint in there and everything's gonna be good. And a lot of times it doesn't help. A lot of times it doesn't help. Now, granted, this was, you know, the last time I did a hand surgery was 30 years ago. So there may be different treatments for this now. But it is a very bad disease. And it's something that the patients are going to have to uh, deal with the rest of their lives. This is the last big topic here, okay? This is more med uh, more anatomical terms that you need to be conversant with, okay? that you need to be conversant with. This is flexion. This is extension, okay? Flexion and extension. You bend your head forwards, flexion. You bend your head back, it's extension. If your head is bent backward further than it normally would, that's called hyperextension. That's called hyperextension. So you can hear about hyperextension whiplash injuries for if you get if you get hit from behind and you're driving in your if you're in your car and get hit from behind your head goes forward and then whips back okay most of the time we have seat rest but if the seat if you're uh, taller than the seat rest 
you get hyperextension injuries, but we have flexion, extension, and hyperextension. We have, and that's not just in the head and neck area, that's actually all over the body. And so in the torso, we have flexion, we have extension, and if we get past this, this point of hyperextension, of, of extension, then we have hyperextension. Some people have uh, loose capsules on their joints and are able to do contortions, okay? Able to do contortions and get into positions that the normal people can't do. Uh, but in a normal person, we have flexion, we have extension. This would be extension, and at any point past, this would be hyperextension, okay? This is abduction. Abduction is the movement. This is the center. This is the midline. The movement away from the center is called abduction. The movement towards the center is called adduction. The movement away from the center is called abduction. The movement towards the center is called adduction. The way I remember this, if a person leaves the throne, they have abducted the throne, okay? They have, they have, the king has abducted the throne, okay? The king has abducted the throne. That's, I'm just telling you this how I remember this. But if you move, if you move a particular joint away from the midline, this is the midline, away from the midline, it's called AB. And when you, when you're in clinical practice, because these sound so similar, you'll talk about abduction and adduction. That's the way you'll talk about it. And everybody knows what you're talking about, abduction and adduction. And so if you get, get used to saying that, then you'll be well on your way. Okay. Oh, there was also uh, circumduction. Circumduction uh, is this movement in a circle. Okay. Rotation, you know, uh, lateral rotation, medial rotation. In other words, if you got your hands with the palms placed on your thighs and you rotate them where your palms are forward, okay, that would be lateral rotation. You rotate it back. There's medial rotation. I see that. I don't see that as being a big thing. Abduction, adduction, flexion, extension. Yes. Okay. Supination and pronation. Okay. If you have your hand out directly in front of you with your palm down, that is pronation. If you have our, your, your arm could be at your side, but your palm is down, that is pronation. If your palm is facing upwards, if your palm is facing superior, that is supination. How I remember that is that is how you carry soup. That's how I remember that. Supination is palm up. Pronation is palm down. Supination is palm up. Pronation is palm down. This is a movement of the ankle. This is inversion and eversion, movement of the ankle. If you have your ankle in a neutral position and you rotate your ankle lateral, okay, rotate your ankle out lateral, that's eversion. You rotate your ankle medial, that's inversion. This is dorsiflexion, okay? This is plantar flexion. Remember, this is the plantar surface of the, of the foot. So this is dorsiflexion, flexion towards the dorsal surface. Remember, the, uh, the ventral surface is anterior, the dorsal surface is posterior. So this is dorsiflexion, flexion towards the dorsal surface. This is plantar, plantar flexion, flexion down beneath, okay? This is all the slides. Now let's talk a little bit about the, well, let's talk some about the exam, okay? Excuse me.